All right, hello everybody. Um, I'm Ryan Bauk. This is Cheng Hong Lin. This is Yuan Li, and this is Cameron Holder. And we're going to be talking to you today about using X-ray tomography to visualize and explore the bulk of materials. So essentially, since we're looking at the bulk, we're not just going to be scratching the surface. And you know, we really were pretty proud of that pun, but because we're doing tomography, we're not going to brag about it. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is our online. Uh, first, I will introduction to the, some X-ray image, and then we will see the image about the direct image and the tomography uh, with the parallel beam image and the transmission X-ray microscope. And then uh, my uh, teammates will uh, share about some uh, application of general tomography and X-ray fluorescence. And here I put a, uh, X-ray image from the transmission X-ray microscope is from a uh, centipede tooth uh, uh, by my uh, former group member. Yeah, I, I think you are all, most of most of you are already tired of that uh, uh, Rengan's wife hand. So I use this hand, uh, no, use this tooth put here to uh, as a uh, X-ray image. And now, why we need X-ray image? You can see uh, from the many, dis uh, many kind of different field, from like uh, ge geoscience, like uh, bioscience, like the uh, material science, or even like uh, in the uh, semiconductor manufacturing, we need different field, different technique, uh, have different uh, uh, structures, and we need to look at these things, we want to look at these things uh, with a uh, same technique if we can. Fortunately, X-ray can do this. So here I make a characterization of X-ray image. I think maybe some of you hear uh, a, lot of about, a lot of things about the X-ray image during this uh, summer school and maybe confused with what is real image, what is coherent image, what is tomography. So first we start uh, with the type of the image. Uh, so first I divide the image into the real image and the coherent different image. The real image means that uh, we get a real image. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a projection or a shadow-like image. Instead of a coherent image, you get a lot of depression peak and you need to did a lot of calculation, do a lot of reverse Fourier transform, and then you get a back image, but you cannot make sure that is right. But uh, coherent image is still very powerful. <laughs> and uh, for the real image part, we can uh, continue to divide it into two parts, like a direct image, or also uh, I call it full field image. And the other part is scanning probe image. And for the direct image, uh, here are we can continue to divide it to into parts like parallel beam image and the transmission X-ray microscope. And from the dimension from the dimension part, we can uh, divide uh, our image into two parts. One is radiography, and the other is tomography. Uh, that's very simple. Radiography is 2D, and uh, tomography is 3D. So uh, in the tomography, the part we focus on today, we have micro CT, like the 1 BM beam line at APS, and the narrow CT, like 32 ID at APS. And by the way, if we combine the coherent different image and the scan, scanning probe image, we can get another uh, image way, like we call it tachography. OK, uh, from this slide, we can see the two kinds of the four image capa uh, capabilities. One is the, uh, just I talked uh, before, is a parallel beam image. The other is a transmission X-ray microscope. Um, I will show, oops, oops. Oh, sorry. Um, the parallel beam image is a, it's a very simple way. You, we just put a sample uh, at the downstream of the beam, and when the beam comes in, hit on the sample, and we get a absorption 
uh, absorption contrast on the detector, and uh, its spatial resolution is uh, around uh, one micrometer. And uh, for the transmission X-ray microscope, we have a more complicated optics design. We have a uh, uh, object lens. We have a, a fresnel zone plate and a, a face ring in our beam line design. It will have a better resolution, close to 20 nanometer. Again, this is also uh, another kind of design of uh, TSM. Uh, here, we use a uh, because in TSM, we need to consider how to focus X-ray. Uh, generally, uh, we have um, several ways to focus X-ray, like uh, we use KB mirror, or we use like this one, capillary condenser. It's, I use a total reflection to, con uh, to focus X-ray. And uh, the other way is use the diffraction way to focus X-ray, like a zero zone plate, like we pick, put here. Yeah, and then the big step is to uh, stop the direct beam, and the pinhole is to, s to select the first order diffraction. And uh, this is a SN image of this guy, the uh, zero zone plate. TSM, the resolution of TSM uh, mostly depends on these optics. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an SN image at the center part, and uh, it's the outermost zone. It's a 40, this one is a 40 nanometer line wise of the outermost zone, and they have around uh, 80, 800, 800 nanometer height. And for this one, this one is uh, uh, to tell you how we uh, get a tomography image this is a very basic uh, design of the uh, micro CT. Here is the, uh, the we X-ray comes from this, and uh, we uh, pass by the shutter and hit on the sample, and now and uh, trans after at the downstream of the beam line, we have the scintillator to convert the X-ray into the optical optical light, and here is a mirror, and the mirror will reflect will reflect the optical light onto the optical lens. Yep. And if we just take one shot at here, we get a 2D image. But if we uh, will align this sample to find its rotation center, and we rotate it a little and take one shot, rotate again, take one shot, we take a series of uh, rotation of the image and uh, we can then stack them together, we can get a 3D image that we call uh, tomography. Also, uh, it's, a, it's also very similar uh, when you take a CT in the hospital, but uh, in the hospital, we don't want to rotate patients. So in the hospital, we rotate detector, and here we detect, uh, sorry, we, did, uh, we rotate a sample. And this is a, uh, real design of the transmission X-ray microscope at uh, APS 32 beam line. Here, X-ray uh, comes here, comes from this side, and it will pass the condenser first, which uh, was not shown here, uh, and hit the, sam the sample, and the uh, sample is here. And uh, after the sample, we have zone plate, and uh, this one, and uh, the uh, face ring, and then far beyond the, this, this, this direction, we have detector. Okay. Yeah. All right, so as you could kind of see in our hierarchical material slide, there's a dynamic range of materials that you really can look at using tomography. So as you can see, this is a slide that was given to us by Francesco at the Bean Line. And you can see there's a tremendous range of materials ranging from biological materials. So for example, we can look at the entanglement of neurons and like say brains. We can look at the growth of cancer cells going through tissue. And in terms of porous material, we can look at the porosity and fracture mechanics in bone. Also, we can then extend that kind of porous material regime into say for energy science, porous fuel cells, 
or superconducting materials or carbon foams or metallic foams. And really the list goes on and on. And it almost seems like there's almost nothing you can study with tomography and any 3D material will be useful except for say a sheet of paper. But as it turns out, tomography is even used to study sheets of paper because just last year, there's actually reconstruction of Dead Sea Scrolls that actually was used to preserve it and use um, basically micro CTs so everyone in any city could just load a database and analyze a scroll. So really tomography has many applications and because of this, we're just gonna focus on a few select cases, uh, mostly ranging through uh, polycrystal materials, metals of added manufacturing, um, some biological applications with scanning probe and XRF, and also a catalysis example. So just talking about polycrystal materials, as you heard in the talk yesterday, we really need to understand how these materials are designed at the mesoscale, and particularly grains ranging from nanoscale to microscale grains significantly influence the properties of the material that are critical for engineering design, such as your yield strength or your fatigue strength. So as it turns out, we need a good way to know where these grains are and as they deform, where they end up. And currently the main method for this, as you can see here, is an EBSD map. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking a cross section of your sample and just looking at the surface, you're hitting up electrons, which then bounce off for backscattering. And through a phosphor detector, you get something called Kikuchi lines, which are then processed through an algorithm to give these absolutely beautiful maps. But the issue of EBSD is many because EBSD is destructive in order to see longer into the material because initially this is just the very surface um, glimpse of just how your material looks. But if you want to see into the bulk, you need to use a tri-beam method and actually cut away layers, which then obviously destroys your sample. But even beyond that, you can destroy your sample just by putting it into an SEM because vacuum conditions or electrons can actually increase the amount of cracking and fatigue you see in your sample. So we really need something that competes with EBSD and the real question is, can tomography bring about the fall of EBSD? Well, let's find out. So as you can see here, this is an EBSD pattern taken of an aluminum alloy with at least three separate phases. As you can see here on the right, you can see far beyond to the surface. This is a 3D projection. And you can also distinguish between these different phases. So EBSD lets us see different phases. That's good. But what else can we truly see in our materials? we can actually see beyond what EBSD can see because now we can look at particulates. So for example, these are three additional aluminum alloys that have different particulates in different directions based off their processing. This, as you can see, is a rolling texture and you can then look at different degrees of texture, but then you can also say, what if I wanna look at voids in my material when it's failing? So as you can see here on the left, this is an aluminum alloy that has been um, undeformed. And you can see on the right, this is an aluminum alloy that was deformed and in the bottom most, this is the largest pore that you can see in your material with each of these individual red components actually being a pore in your aluminum. And you can actually then gauge how your material is deforming by looking at the distribution, the size of the final pores. But then you ask yourself, what else can you do with this? You also can look at cracking. So as you can see here, this is a, um, aluminum alloy that's been treated with hydrogen and looking at the effects of hydrogen embrittlement, you can then see how these cracks are propagating on your surface. But we still haven't answered the final question. Okay, EBSD can give us this information about grains. How can this give us information about grains? And I promised you that we were gonna brag, but we're gonna brag a little. Because now we have to look at tomography with diffraction contrast. So essentially what we're doing is combining the tomography setup that we just showed you in the previous image. And what we do is we take our sample, we rotate it on an angle omega, and as different grains of the polycrystal material come into the Bragg condition, they'll actually start to disappear in intensity from this projected image, and actually you'll start to see diffraction spots appear on your detector, which then lets you know where those grains initially were that were diffracting, and then also gives you an idea of the orientation. So essentially what this allows you to do is go back to that tomography image and then say, okay, we have this 3D reconstruction, we know information about the voids and the fatigue and the cracks and all the different mechanical, interesting mechanical features, and we can also then look at those exact same regions and see how the grains are reorienting, which is amazing. And what we can do is then extend that further by taking different slices. So for example, with the micro CT and even now the nano CT, we're able to get high level resolution of these grains down to the micron and even the nanometers now. So you can do different studies by then isolating these grains even further to look at nearest neighbor interactions or intergrain interactions. And then similarly, you can even break this down even further with more advanced algorithms to get grain boundary resolution. So EBSD is a solid technique, but tomography is a very powerful contender nowadays. The main issue with it is that you need to get beam time, so you need to write good proposals. 
So then what we can then do is talk about additive manufacturing, which now I'm gonna lean over to you on. I think everybody have a good trip at the MDF. We see the very, very uh, fancy car. And also we know that if you pay attention, there are actually two kinds of uh, additive manufacturing machines. Uh, one is the electron beam uh, melting, another is laser melting. Today uh, I will take something, uh, talk something about the, this tomography study on this laser melting. We know that the laser melting can reach a very high temperature, so it quench rest is very quick. It reach about 10 to the order of 6K per second, and phase change is, very, is in uh, microsecond, so it's very fast. So if we want to study this uh, so fast process, we have to use the uh, high-speed detector. At the beam line and 32 IDB, there is a very uh, high-speed detector. It has a uh, temporal resolution is uh, 100 picosecond, and that can that has uh, the uh, fixture for the uh, laser melting. Uh, this is the uh, time resolve study of the uh, laser melting. So we can see here the laser melt these part these particles. So we see that out of the laser melting there is some. Uh, 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 fusion region the, is the welding pole. So by this uh, tomography, you can see what's exactly happening during the laser melting. The, the depth and this can give a uh, very direct uh, insight of this uh, laser melting. How about, uh, uh, you, you know that during this additive manufacturing, uh, one, there are several problems is uh, uh, prosody, uh, me mechanical property is very important. What will uh, affect these mechanical properties? Uh, during this uh, uh, printing, there's uh, porosity and there's some radio stress during this region. So just as an expansion, if we can uh, take an imaging and then take diffraction, uh, also use the Bragg law, we calculate the despacing uh, around the welding pole, we can see how the uh, radio stress uh, uh, um, distribute. So this is the, the laser melting point. We will measure the diffraction pattern along this, uh, uh, away from the distance, at, diff at different distance along this uh, melting region. So we see how the diffraction pattern evolves at the, at the distance, at the functional distance. So this is the region of that melting. This, there is no diffraction pattern, means this uh, liquid phase. But after it cool down, there is a, this is the metal, so it has a diffractive patterns. As the cool down, it has, uh, it will have, it will have the solid phase. And away from the welding pole, we can see the um, microstructure changes, this intensity. The intensity changes will give us information of the, uh, the peak intensity and peak position. We give us the, the information of uh, the texture, the micro strain. So by analyzing this, we can have a, uh, have, a, have an idea of what's, what's the strain distribution along this uh, 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 away from the welding pole. And also by reconstructing the 3D thermography, we can see how the porosity diffusion inside the uh, 3D printed product. And <clears throat> Here is another one uh, example of the nano city uh, of the platinum catalysis in fuel cell. And it's a, because, because the video has some problems, I need to back out to this mode and uh, to play it. Do I click? Oh, sorry. Yes, you can see. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> next.
So for us, it's in like 60 seconds. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So fluorescence, right? You have some instant X-ray. Uh, let me back up here. Okay. So fluorescence. So they've gotten uh, these three have gone through um, tomography, and so what you can do with this is that now you can layer different characterization techniques on top of that. And one of these characterization techniques is X-ray fluorescence, right? So you take an instant X-ray. Um, it ejects a core electron, and then the relaxation of one of the other electrons um, releases a, either K-alpha or K-beta, depending upon the shell. And so um, <clears throat> this X-ray uh, fluorescence tomography is done at uh, the 13BM line at the APS. And so um, a schematic is kind of shown here where um, the beam comes in, is focused by, the, or wavelengths are selected by the monochromator focus down, hits a sample, the sample is going to be rastered back and forth um, through the beam, and then the uh, fluorescence is going to be detected. And so um, an example of this, uh, our experiment was looking at this Arabidopsis seeds, so they're uh, just biologically relevant systems. And so this seed was rotated 360 degrees through the beam while also being rastered, and so a sinogram was created, uh, much like the one shown here. And then after a transform, you could get this reconstructed image of an XY, of a XY slice through the seed. Um, in addition, the fluorescence uh, can be seen overlaid on top of this image, so you can get uh, spatially correlated um, elemental composition. So, uh, which is actually pretty cool, right? All right. So in summary, I hope that we have kind of uh, informed you guys of why. Tomography is pretty cool, right? So it's uh, very useful in a whole lot of different fields. You can get spatially dependent elemental information. Um, and then, uh, so we've come a long way from the uh, x-rays here. And so some challenges to address in the future uh, include some data reduction algorithms as well as uh, looking at how to um, not have your sample degrade on, uh, when placed in the beam. And so with that, we'd like to acknowledge uh, the beamline scientists at Argonne, as well as the coordinators for the MX school as here at Oak Ridge and at the APS and at the DOE, as you all for listening. So we have to take any questions. So the diffraction contrast, I actually believe that it may not actually be at APS, even though I think they do have the capabilities. I know for certain that it is at ESRF, and I think because of 1-1-D and the high energy diffraction experiments, that may be why there's not as much of a focus on those experiments at the beamline that we were at at 2-BM. Right with the micro lowy. So those are really uh, X-ray analog, non-destructive versions of mm -hmm. uh, the SEM. Yep. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.